Today we continue our workshop with presentation by Dr. Christian Ladja. He made several changes, small changes. Yes, oh, oh. Christian, please. So, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, it, there is some change that I explained to you. Uh, yesterday, in the first part, I addressed half of my presentation, but I covered, I would say, most of the pollutions. So it seems to be more logical now to speak about uh, sodium quality control, okay, during uh, one hour and a half. And then I will come back on the second part of my presentation of yesterday at the end of the morning and materials this afternoon, if you agree. It's just to have more logical progression. Sorry for this. So, um, okay. Uh, and if you don't mind, sometimes I will sit uh, in front of my screen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, as you know, for each uh, coolant. In fact, it's uh, quite necessary to address the coolant quality control and purification, of course, to keep some requirements, to satisfy some requirements. And so it's very important for any coolant, in fact. So here I will address the specific case of sodium fast reactor, but if you have questions about the uh, later on, on the other uh, lead, for example, we can also have a short discussion on this point. About uh, so SFR, it's uh, generally for the uh, for the primary coolant. I have written as XFR. X can be uh, S, of course, for sodium, or L for fast reactor uh, for uh, lead. So oxygen is a. Oops, sorry. Uh, oxygen is a key parameter of uh, corrosion, okay, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, consequences. The two kinds of consequences of oxygen, it can be a corrosion, so it means a reduction of the thickness of the wall, or, and generally, of course, contamination, because we produce activated corrosion products, and we can induce some dosimetry. So the dosimetry is not maybe uh, an issue, a big issue if you don't have to have maintenance operation, but it is clear that uh, if uh, you have to, uh, let's say, remove an uh, intermediate heat exchanger or any component for repair, for example, you have to deal with this uh, contamination and this dosimetry, consequently, this dosimetry. So necessity to decontaminate, uh, handling, Repair. It can be also for in-service inspection. Also, sometimes you need to, to be able to be near, even if we have uh, now some strategies to have uh, access to the wells, for example, to be controlled without any uh, hazards of uh, any constraints due to the contamination. So, generally, it's necessary to master the oxygen. Uh, uh, oxygen well mastered can help to maintain oxide layer stable. This is uh, for, uh, you know, for lead, okay, and particularly heavy liquid metals, because in order to limit uh, liquid metal embrightenment, which is a phenomena which can be deleterious for the integrity of the components, it's uh, necessary to maintain this uh, oxide layer, even if there is some other options. Uh, some other options like uh, coatings, for example, you know that uh, for uh, materials, for cladding, uh, for every liquid metals, it's possible to aluminize, uh, for example, the cladding with, uh, let's say, uh, Geza, Geza process uh, uh, developed in Karlsruhe. And uh, of course, uh, but oxide is a, a protection. And you know why? Because, in fact, when you have oxide, you have uh, less wetting, and so less interaction between the liquid metal and the structural material. Uh, oxygen can induce also precipitation 
of some coolant oxide. For example, uh, for heavy liquid metal, you can have a, a precipitation of lead oxide because uh, it's due, uh, of course, we have an uh, effect of solubility, but also the lead oxide has a low uh, lead oxide in the lead or lead bismuth uh, coolant. You have a very uh, almost no uh, dissolution, in fact, dissolution in the sodium. Uh, instead of uh, for sodium, for example, uh, for sodium, due to the fact that the uh, sodium is a reducing element, uh, as soon as you have a, 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 a production of sodium oxide, you have a dissolution in the sodium. And so it means that the oxygen in a sodium is not uh, as a particulate, generally. It has a dissolved, and so uh, you have to reduce the concentration in oxygen, which is dissolved in the, in the, in the sodium. So it's quite different uh, situation than with heavy liquid metals. And uh, also, in some cases, uh, you can, uh, if you have oxygen, if you have uh, binary alloys, like lead bismuth, or in another case, not for here, but lead lithium, for example, if you have oxidation, uh, one of the two uh, compounds Okay, like uh, lead or lithium in the case of lead lithium, you, you, you can modify the composition. So it means that you need to introduce uh, the, uh, maybe the element, the, the, the compound, which is uh, oxidized. So there are some consequences of this oxygen. Uh, for intermediate circuits, and this is typically uh, only the case for a sodium fast reactor, I recall you that we foresee in the sodium fast reactor uh, uh, an intermediate circuit just only because we want to avoid any hazards of sodium, uh, of interaction between the primary sodium, which is activated, okay, with the sodium 22 and sodium 24. You remember yesterday my lecture. And so for this reason, we need to. Uh, uh, we need to, uh, uh, sorry, to, to avoid a potential interaction between this primary sodium and the water with production of gas. And uh, you, as you know, in a reactor, we absolutely avoid the uh, transfer of gas bubbles in the core in order to uh, avoid any uh, reactivity uh, issues in the core. Okay. So this is a, a point. But for intermediate circuits, we, we have to deal with, uh, I will explain later, uh, hydrogen produced by the, uh, coming from the co continuous corrosion of the, on the, in the steam generator. We have in any steam generator, it's not specific of sodium, huh? it's for all systems um, uh, equipped with a Rankine, uh, Rankine cycle energy conversion system based on the Rankine cycle, and you produce, uh, you produce by corrosion on the water side some hydrogen, magnetite and hydrogen. And for this reason, uh, you, we have an introduction of hydrogen in the intermediate circuit. But we will see later that thanks to this hydrogen, and by trapping this hydrogen in the secondary loop uh, circuit, we trap also the tritium uh, produced by the produced in the primary uh, by a ternary fission of plutonium or coming from the boron carbide. So, uh, due to that, it's necessary if you want to detect very quickly a sodium water uh, interaction due to uh, ingress of steam in the intermediate circuit, it's absolutely necessary to have in steady state operation a very low hydrogen content in order to have a, to detect very early the sodium water interaction in the intermediate circuit. This is for the binary. And uh, in the, for all the circuits, of course, if you have a too high concentration, if you have a cold points, you can have a, a crystallization of sodium oxide or end sodium hydride also 
in some uh, places. And so, if you want to avoid any plugging or any uh, plugging of uh, uh, narrow gaps, for example, it's necessary to, to maintain, to keep the oxygen and hydrogen content <coughs> in a flow in order to avoid any hazards related to this uh, situation. Okay. So uh, now coming back to the to the sodium, we are going to to check again. Maybe I have already said some points <laughs> on the why it's necessary to purify the sodium. I'm going to explain you uh, what we did uh, on the basic phenomena of crystallization. I think for students it's interesting because uh, uh, in the past uh, you will see that uh, it was uh, the, this uh, component, what we call cold trap, was based only on uh, a uh, therm thermohydraulic and thermal approach. And in fact, uh, it's necessary to have a, a more, I would say, chemical engineering approach in order to uh, design, uh, to have a better design of this, uh, of this uh, component. And I will uh, show you that from this basic data and also from the operational uh, feedback coming from the reactors like Phoenix or Super Phoenix and others, how we have developed new concepts taking into account the feedback and also the, the basic data like uh, kinetics, in fact, kinetics of phenomena. And at the end, uh, I will address some more specific uh, points like uh, how we do mass balance, uh, mass balance of the traps, how to follow this compound, this component. And I will explain you also what is the evolution of the design, what we did in the 80s, okay, you were maybe not born at this time, but, and how we proceed now, uh, taking into account the, all this data we have uh, gathered. Okay, so just uh, to, to recall, and I go in the first part uh, first. Uh, here you can see uh, a scheme I have uh, shown to you yesterday. You can see here uh, introduction of, uh, I would say, for example, fresh fuel uh, with uh, uh, the, the clad and the metallic surface, and you have an uh, introduction of pollution, okay? Because sodium is a reducing, uh, reducing element. So, uh, okay, this is exactly, here you can see what I explained to you, here, it's uh, some kind of uh, uh, drawing showing on the right side in green a uh, pipe in the steam generator. Inside the pipe, you have the water, and you have a corrosion producing magnetite and hydrogen. In case of a leak, you have injection of water and production of hydrogen in the secondary circuit, but also in steady state operation inside uh, the water. You have, as I told you, uh, corrosion. Even if we try to limit this uh, corrosion by um, using uh, some uh, products like hydrazine, for example. Uh, hydrazine is uh, N2H4, okay, which uh, is used to limit the oxygen uh, level in the water, on the water side. Okay. Uh, just recall that uh, uh, we have uh, here the solubilities, okay? We use uh, for the sodium, as I told you yesterday, uh, for the oxygen, we can use uh, an northern law. Uh, there are some uh, different laws uh, which are very close, generally speaking. And on the secondary loop, we have a, a solubility law uh, produced by uh, Dr. Whittingham in the UK, and it's generally a good reference. For oxygen, there are many, many uh, solubility laws. For hydrogen, much less. Okay. So we have on the primary loop a uh, requirement to keep the oxygen below 3 ppm. Okay. 3 ppm, if you look here, corresponds to about 150 degrees Celsius uh, in terms of saturation temperature. I will explain in more detail what is the saturation and solubility. And for hydrogen, is uh, generally we accept uh, below 0.1 ppm, uh, 100 ppb, okay? 
of hydrogen. It seems very low, but in fact, it's uh, rather easy to, to obtain, okay? There is no difficulty, particular difficulty. Of course, if you are in steady state operation, in case of uh, sodium water interaction, for example, it's clear that you can have uh, higher values, okay? So, continue, so uh, we have uh, different pollution sources. Uh, one is, uh, some of them are continuous, so the diffusion of hydrogen through steam generator units uh, walls and impurities in cover gas sometimes also you can have a very very small pollution and as this continues uh, oxide dissolution in sodium when you introduce a metallic surface and in this case it is clearly uh, discontinuous because it's after uh, when you introduce uh, a certain number of uh, fuel assemblies in the in the reactor of course you have a pollution then we will purify and then in steady state operation you have no pollution, no additional pollution. Air ingress after repair. Uh, in case uh, when you repair, uh, sometimes you, you, you have not a perfect uh, tightness of the system and you need to, uh, you, you need to uh, take into account uh, air ingress. Air ingress and uh, with air ingress you have oxygen and uh, moisture. Okay? So you have uh, some pollution and after that when you fill again the circuit with the sodium, with the, you have a pollution. Uh, water ingress uh, in a steam generator unit, of course, when you have a sodium water interaction. Sometimes we faith in the past oil ingress. It was the case, for example, in PFR, in PFR reactor in UK, uh, in Scotland, exactly. Uh, we, there, there was some pollution with oil. When you have oil, interaction between oil and sodium produces uh, produce tar, hydrogen, methane, and so on. Of course, limited amounts, but you have some pollution of the, of the, of the sodium and also of the cover gas with carbon products. Metallic filling due to maintenance. Yes, it happens sometimes. It was the case in Kain Katu reactor in Germany. It, uh, in Germany, there was an experimental reactor which was closed at the beginning of the 90s and there was uh, some uh, metallic filling uh, due to maintenance. Okay, uh, main process for sodium purification now. Uh, when you have these impurities, of course, the two most uh, more important impurities are oxygen, from oxygen, or hydrogen. Hydrogen uh, in the secondary circuit mostly, okay. So, uh, it is uh, necessary first, as I told you yesterday, to obtain nuclear grade sodium. So this is the business of a company who supplies the sodium, okay, clearly. Huh? Uh, of course, before to start a reactor, you have, to, you have a initial cleaning of the loop, components and vessels, and particularly we have, um, um, we circulate uh, hot, hot nitrogen, let's say around 200 degrees Celsius, with two goals, one is to heat up all the structures is not an uh, easy task because you have a lot of uh, structures. And uh, also you dry, I would say you dry more or less the, the structures in order to reduce the pollution. Okay, so this operation has been done for all the reactors. I think it was uh, recently done or currently done in uh, India for PFR reactor. You know that in India, it's, uh, they are not finishing the manufacturing. They are, I, I've seen that yesterday. It's a commissioning, commissioning phase, and maybe they should be, they should start to, to fill up the, the reactor with the sodium. Of course, at uh, the very beginning, we have also filtering, because uh, when you have a so large amount of sodium, even if the sodium product supplied by the company is clean, you have to filter. For example, for Super Phoenix, we have uh, uh, four levels of filters before the, for the sodium to enter in the, in the, in the reactor. Uh, cold trapping, this is the main point, this is the main process for these uh, large size systems. We will see that also there is another technology I will not address too much, but hot trapping, we developed hot traps for, for some very specific applications. I will show you after. And of course, the key, the key point is uh, the uh, when you operate, and particularly during the maintenance and so on, to limit the ingress of pollution by appropriate 
operating rules. You have to avoid any, uh, you have to work uh, with a, a very clean approach. A crystallization. So our system for cold trapping is based on the crystallization of impurities. Uh, you know that there are three, uh, three different technologies for, to promote crystallization. One is liquid evaporation, like salt. You maybe know that, huh, to produce a very good salt. And uh, so it's not, it could be in principle possible. You can extract the sodium from the reactor, uh, evaporate, distillate, I would say, huh, and then uh, recover the pure sodium and so on. No, it's not, uh, forget it, okay, too complex. Uh, reduction of the solubility by adding some additive impurity. Sometimes it happens, and when you want to produce beautiful crystals, can be used. So, but in a nuclear system, it's difficult to imagine. It. <coughs> and for sodium, I don't know which product we could add. But you modify by adding some products the solubility law of impurities, and you promote the crystallization. So, uh, it's used in the la uh, uh, laboratories in chemistry, but not here. And uh, the, the last point, which is uh, uh, used uh, uh, extensively, is cooling the liquid below saturation temperature. Of course, the last option is the most attractive. It's easy to implement. We, pro we, we need to have uh, cooling, okay? And of course, to foresee uh, solid retention. So important point is to understand the solubility, because if you understand this phenomena, after that it's uh, quite easy to understand, to understand uh, how we operate. Here you have a so-called diagram of Oswald and Myers, where you have a concentration as a function of temperature. Just, uh, I take an example of the morning, okay, coffee. <laughs> you introduce a piece of sugar in your coffee, okay, you increase the concentration, of course, okay. And uh, what you can do is add a second, if you like, sugar, okay, two pieces of sugar, and, and uh, nothing happens. And if, what happens if you increase more? Sometimes you have, a, you have no, no more dissolution, so your piece of sugar remains uh, uh, in, the, in the sodium, but not sticky. So it means no dissolution. So, and if you want to recover your, your sugar, you can filter your coffee and, uh, okay, you get back your, a part, of the, a part of the sugar because one part is dissolved, okay? Now, okay, you, have, uh, you are uh, serious, uh, you are serious and you say, okay, just only two, even if, uh, okay, it's maybe too much, but two pieces of sugar and instead to drink your coffee, you go to discuss with colleagues, with friends and so on. And what happens, what happens here? Do you know what happened? Yes, you have no crystallization, in fact, uh, because, in fact, you have the solubility curve here, mm -hmm. but, uh, in fact, you need to have uh, additional sursaturation to create the good conditions to have nucleation. If you reach what we call the sursolubility curve, uh, you go through what we call the metastable region you reach a point where we have nucleation, okay? Nucleation. And uh, it means that you create new small, very small crystals, nuclei, we call that nuclei, and you produce these uh, this, uh, crystals. If you, uh, if, you, if you stop here, in fact, if you are at this level with this concentration and this temperature, nothing happens except, except, if, except, if you had a piece of sugar, a crystal of sugar, it will grow, okay? You have no new crystals, but you have a growth of this crystal, okay? And, okay, here what happens? But in fact, you have a crystallization of sugar at the bottom. And in this case, you don't filter because the sugar uh, sticks. Uh, at the bottom, okay? You need to add some hot water, okay, to, uh, okay, to clean up. So in this case, you have had what we call heterogeneous nucleation. It means that you have uh, crystals, but these crystals need to have a support, okay? Uh, a structural support to support the, the, the crystals, okay? If you have understood this example, is the same, cold trap is the same. About. Never, never happened to me. 
<laughs> okay. So, uh, in terms of nucleation, we are generating his uh, enthalpy uh, diagram with uh, delta G and the nucleus size. In fact, um, we, the, when you have structure, you can have what we call heterogeneous nucleation. And it needs a lower level of energy uh, to have this uh, nucleation. Uh, if uh, you want to have a nucleation in the bulk, in the liquid metal bulk, you need uh, more energy. But in practice, in practice, generally for sodium, we never reach the right conditions to have homogeneous nucleation. So we don't have crystals of sodium or hydride of sodium oxide inside the, inside the sodium. We generally have only, uh, only a nucleation on the structural material. So it's the first point. So it means that the cold trap is not really a filter, okay? You provide the support, this is important, because sometimes people say it's a filter. No, it's not a filter, okay? You, have a, it's a, you provide the structure and the surface to promote heterogeneous nucleation. So it's different. Okay, nucleation phenomena. Okay, so again, so about the growth. The growth, uh, in fact, we, we assume that, uh, sorry, yes, I show first this one. If you, here you have a crystal, okay? Uh, you can see we have a boundary layer and you have here the sodium circulation and uh, we have in the sodium a concentration, we have a, a, a temperature, and so you can have a supersaturation at this level. And so in this case, yeah. you can have, uh, you, you, can, uh, you have, uh, we assume that we have uh, some boundary layer. We have a diffusion of the impurities through this uh, layer. And then a second step, is the integration of these uh, atoms, in fact, these ions, because we are in a reducing uh, field. And you have integration of this impurity, uh, of these atoms, oxygen or hydrogen, on the, on the crystal, in the crystal lattice, okay, in the structure of the crystal. Here you can see, uh, uh, show your different layers and increase the number of layers when you increase the the, when you have uh, uh, growth. Uh, in fact, the kinetics of the overall phenomena is the kinetics of the lowest uh, step. It means that uh, it's like when you are going to the stadi stadium, okay, of football, sometimes you have a control, okay, they control your backs and so on. So generally you have a lot of, uh, okay, your kinetic to reach your seat in the stadium is limited by the control of the bags, okay? And here, the, it can be the first step. And the second step can be uh, if you run very fastly between the control and your seat, uh, you can uh, reach time. So we will see that there are two steps, and if you have a very slim, you can go through the, very quickly through the control. This is typically the case of hydrogen, okay? Hydrogen is a small atom, okay, and go through uh, the, the control and reach, and after that, uh, you can reach quickly your seat. Oxygen, which is more, uh, fat. it uh, needs more time. So it's the reason why, for example, in these two steps here, we will see, we have demonstrated, and I will show you after, that the oxygen, the limiting step of the oxygen is the diffusion through this uh, boundary layer. And in this case, when a phenomena is uh, limited by the dissolution, it is the order of the kinetic is one, okay? And if the, it has been demonstrated also by more phenomenological studies and uh, theoretical studies, uh, models, uh, that the integration in the lestis, the order is two, okay? Uh, it's a model called the model of Burton, Cabrera, and Frank, which was improved, but uh, the order was never changed, okay? So, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, so here you have the kinetics, okay? Diffusion through a boundary layer, you have here the kinetic is generally a constant, which is a function of the temperature also. This is a Arrhenius low, uh, a reference surface, and the difference between the concentration 
in the bulk and the concentration at the interface. We assume that effectively we have a concentration here. Uh, sorry. Yeah. We assume that we have a concentration. This is a concentration in sodium. We have an intermediate concentration at this level, which is an equilibrium value. And it's, uh, but you can understand that it is not easy to measure this concentration close to a crystal. So this kinetic, this is the first kinetic. The second one is the integration step in the crystal solution interface with an order which is, can be, uh, which is generally two, okay? And due to the fact it is difficult to know intermediate concentration, we use what we call an overall equation, okay? Which integrates the two. And if the growth is limited by the diffusion step, then the kinetic uh, and the, the order is one, and if uh, the growth is limited by the integration step in the crystal lattice, the order is two. Okay, here you can see the theoretical law. Here you can see a crystal of oxide in liquid sodium. Okay, so you can see these uh, layers. Okay, it's not just only a theory. Uh, it's, uh, it's also the same for uh, sodium uh, chloride, uh, natural sodium chloride. We, we can see this, uh, these shapes also at the microscope. Uh, two gross phenomena, if you have a very low supersaturation, it means if you are near the solubility, you have a pyramid, you have a, what we call a regular growth, and you have a pyramid, and you have, a, in case of high supersaturation, we have a dendritic growth, okay? Very beautiful uh, things you can observe in a cold trap, okay? So what we did, we uh, made a lot of uh, experiments in the 80s, and um, we measured the kinetics of nucleation and growth only for sodium oxide with a circuit just only operated with oxygen, and just only for hydrogen in a circuit only polluted with uh, hydrogen, okay? So it was a complex approach, and, uh, but, uh, to, to two different steps with our facilities. And uh, we established the kinetics and particularly the energy of activation of the Arrhenius law and also the order okay, of, the, of the kinetics. You can see here for the nucleation, you can observe that, uh, maybe, sorry, we will see just after, yes. Here the, you have the kinetics, okay? And here you have the order. Uh, just so, well, what we can notice is that for nucleation kinetics, we have a, a large impact. If you look here, the activation energy for hydride is uh, very high compared to the compared to the to the sodium uh, compared to the sodium oxide. Okay, minus 60, and so it means that uh, there is a large influence of temperature for the sodium hydride nucleation. And for the growth, you can see that the two, uh, as I told you, uh, the story of the stadium, okay? Uh, you can see that the order of, uh, for oxide we have found is uh, one. It means that the, the phenomena of growth is limited by the diffusion of the oxygen between the sodium bulk and the crystal lattice. And for the hydride, it's quite different. The limiting step is not the diffusion, it's the integration in the crystal lattice. So it means very theoretical. But now uh, we are going to see how we have used these results, okay? Uh, before that, I just recall the principle of operation of a cold trap. So here you have always the diagram, concentration temperature. In a cold trap, generally is a vertical position, okay? <laughs> but here, for explanation, we prefer to put the uh, cold trap in a, in a relaxed position, <laughs> okay? So you have a horizontal, here you can see intra inlet of sodium, and then we circulate in a, what we call exchanger economizer. In fact, uh, the sodium cooled coming from the cold trap and going out, purified, 
uh, helps to cool down the, the sodium entering in the, in, the, in the cold trap. And here you have a, a, an external cooler. Here you can see. This is here in this case, for example, a coil in which we circulate oil. Okay? Uh, oil. And in order to exchange between this external jacket and the internal, this uh, coil is uh, inside a static sodium potassium alloy. Why uh, so sodium potassium? Because as you know, sodium potassium is uh, liquid at ambient temperature. So it means if you cool down the cold trap, you have always a liquid and you have not uh, stresses, mechanical stresses on the, on the structure. And so at the end, so you cool down. You, here you reach the coldest point, okay? Uh, and you create the, in this area, okay, oops, yes, uh, you, you, when you reach this point, you have not a crystallization of sugar, clearly, but uh, you crystal, uh, crystal of oxide and hydride, okay? And so uh, you have a uh, crystallization in this lower part. Here you have some kind of mesh, a metallic mesh, generally used. In fact, you create uh, conditions to, to create a, a lot of positions for nucleation of crystals. Yeah? And so in this area, you have a, a mesh with a certain density. Uh, density in order if you want, it depends if you want to have more sites or less and so on. There is some uh, design rules here. And uh, so the sodium goes through and enter in the inner pipe and circulate here in the heat exchanger. Uh, in order to cool down the, uh, the uh, sodium entering into, in the cold trap, okay? Here you can see a wire covered by crystals, okay? And, uh, okay, so what is important to notice is that there are two main parameters, operating parameters, the flow rate of sodium, of course, and the, and the temperature, and the temperature. And it is clear that uh, the cold point temperature is the key point. And this, what you need to know and to fix this temperature, you need to, uh, you need to know at which temperature you, you uh, promote crystal, crystals. For this purpose, we use uh, an apparatus uh, called plug-in indicator. It's a system which allows you to detect, uh, you cool down your fluid, and you identify at which temperature you, uh, you promote the nucleation. Uh, I will show you in more details a little bit after. So you need an information about, about the concentration, and then you fix, of course, you need to estimate this, uh, these temperatures here, what we call plugging temperature. It means temperature at which you create uh, crystals. And you need, of, of course, to fix the cold trap temperature, let's say we have used uh, to use 20 degrees lower because it corresponds to some kind of uh, optimal conditions, okay? So this is the way we, we process. And so, uh, and, uh, okay, so this is the principle, okay? So what are the criteria when you design? We move to the design. Uh, what are the criteria is, of course, we are, what we call is uh, instantaneous efficiency. What is, uh, if you have a very good cold trap, well designed, when you enter at the concentration, the concentration at the outlet, what is the minimum concentration is here, in fact, exactly here. Okay, you can not be in the undersaturated area, but you reach this, uh, this point and then you, you go out. But the kinetics is not an uh, instantaneous uh, phenomena, the crystallization. So it means, in fact, in the system, which depends on the circulation, the flows, and so on, you, you have, uh, you have uh, of course, you, you generally in the past uh, design, the cold traps, they never reach an efficiency of one. What is the efficiency? So me, uh, uh, concentra variation of concentration is concentration at inlet minus concentration at the outlet. And the maximum is concentration at inlet minus the concentration. The minimum concentration you can reach is at this level. It is explained here. Okay. 
this is exactly. So this value, this uh, ratio, is uh, between 0 and 1. The purification rate is uh, the efficiency multiplied by the concentration at the inlet minus the concentration corresponding to the cold point temperature multiplied by the flow rate. The capacity is, in fact, the filling rate of each uh, area in the cold trap we will see that it can be the mesh, uh, the, the mesh, the, the, the liquid, the, 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 the wires of uh, steel uh, devoted to crystallize, for the crystallization, and sometimes uh, cooling, cooling surface, particularly for hydrogen. Okay, the capacity, uh, it's important because uh, you, this apparatus, okay, you fill it, and at the end, uh, you have an evolution of the flow dynamics we show you during the modeling uh, later and it's important to it's important to know that uh, we uh, uh, sorry i lose my it's important to to uh, to design appropriately the different zones of the of the system okay and the compactness what is the compactness is uh, just here, you can see that you can have a cold trap where you have a very small uh, part of the volume used for the impurities, okay? And uh, uh, with a very large component, maybe 10 meters and 2 meters uh, diameter to trap uh, 5 liters of impurities. Okay, you will say it's not optimized. Also, so there is, clear, uh, there is a clear parameter um, in a, in a reactor, when you design the systems, you need to have uh, 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 the, the best uh, volume in a given volume to uh, optimize the filling the filling rate of this uh, of this volume, and particularly for the primary circuits, because as the sodium is active, we want to avoid uh, we we there is uh, generally for a, an external cold trap inertization inertization of the of the building, and so in this case. Uh, uh, the cost uh, and uh, you could have a, a big impact on the design of the on the of the of the plant okay uh, so generally the purification rate has to be the highest why it's important when you have a big reactor when you want to clean up uh, sodium a primary sodium for example if you say to the operator like edf or nersa for uh, super phoenix i need uh, two months to purify if uh, two months of operation lost, okay, because uh, your concentration is too high, of course he's not very happy, okay, because the uh, uh, one million euro per day lost. Uh, <laughs> so it means that clearly there is a, an economic impact of the design, and there is a clear uh, objective to have a very high purification rate. Uh, capacity, the highest value is the best for the design, for the engineering, uh, for the design of the building. Capacity has to be the, uh, so in, it depends on the strategy. You can have a small cold trap you remove uh, periodically, or you can have a, a trap you, you implement for the whole life of the reactor. But don't forget that we trap not only imp uh, impurities like oxygen and hydrogen, but also we trap, it's not problem of volume of impurities but of contamination we trap also uh, activated corrosion products in some aspect and so you can accumulate some uh, high, very high dissymmetry and so in this case for the when you want to replace or for the decommissioning we could have a, a, an important impact on the cost of the decommissioning of this system which is I would say the kidneys the kidneys of the of the reactor okay here you have the kinetics, okay, the solubilities, okay, you have seen. A plugging meter to measure the oxygen content. Here you have, uh, uh, in this part, uh, you have the uh, circulation of sodium from, uh, uh, sorry, we have inlet of sodium circulating in the space uh, here, okay. When you arrive here, this is, uh, we have a cooler here. And at this level, we have a, what we call a pellet, okay, with uh, 12 grooves. And you, when, you have, uh, when you reach the solubility, uh, super solubility, exactly, you, uh, you create nucleation. And due to the fact you have a very narrow, uh, narrow 
holes, uh, you have a plugging. Okay? So if you follow the temperature by cooling the sodium, and if you follow the flow rate, when you have a, a nucleation, you have a partial plugging of these uh, holes, and you have a, a reduction of the, uh, of the flow rate. Okay, this is just an illustration. Here you have in red the, the temperature. Okay, it's automatic, uh, in fact. Uh, so you have a reduction, you have a high temperature, you have a reduction. When you reach, for example, a certain value, it can be uh, 150, but in some case, we, have, we reach 110 because it's a minimum temperature, I would say. If we are below, uh, below 100, there is a risk to, have a, uh, to freeze the sodium, okay? So we stay above, okay? But uh, thanks to the solubilities, uh, when you reach this value, you have uh, an information about the, the concentration. It's an estimation, but if you are used for that, I don't go in detail, but you uh, have a good appreciation of the content. Okay, and after that, you have a plug-in here. You can notice, you start the plug-in here, and the reduction of the, uh, we have a slope here. So it means that you have precipitation of impurities in the, in the, in the, in the narrow holes. And then, when you reach a minimum value of the flow meter, uh, of the flow rate, it's necessary to increase again the temperature. Why? Because if not, uh, there is a risk to have a total plug, and in this case, if it is hydride, it's possible to have a thermal decomposition at 300. But if it is a, a plug of oxide, um, the decomposition of <coughs> sodium oxide is above 900 degrees Celsius. So it means that you need to replace, put the plugging indicator at the garbage, and uh, start with a new one. Okay? So it's clear that we have a plugging temperature here, but sometimes there is a good estimation of the concentration by measuring what we call unplugging temperature. Because unplugging, it means that in the groove, in the narrow holes, you have some kind of equilibrium, equilibrium between the, uh, the growth and the dissolution also. So it means that you are very near the solubility curve. Solubility is associated to the saturation temperature, and thanks to the solubility laws, you can know more accurately the concentration of the, of the, of the impurities, okay? And if you are, uh, we, have, we did that, for example, in a specific case in Super Phoenix when we have the, a large pollution, you can, uh, when you are near the unplugging temperature, you increase the temperature, you observe a dissolution, you reduce again the temperature, you observe a crystallization and so on. So you can manually, uh, establish more accurately the, the concentration. Okay, this is the plugging curves during air ingress in Super Phoenix. Oops, sorry. Uh, we, we uh, you know, in Super Phoenix, we have an ingress of air of, in the primary circuit. A large amount of air, but, but due to the fact we had a very large amount of sodium, uh, 3,000, uh, 3,000, 500 tons of sodium, about. Uh, we reach a pollution, we reach a value of 15 ppm. Instead to have less, less than 3 ppm, we reach 15. For some operators, foreign operators, they consider it's not too far, <laughs> not too high. But in our case, effectively, we consider that it was not acceptable. So we stopped, down, stopped the, the reactor, purify it in the less than uh, less uh, four months about okay to reach uh, uh, a good value but we lose uh, four four months of production of a reactor of uh, 1200 megawatt uh, electrical megawatt uh, you lose a lot of money of course so it was an event in uh, june 1990 and uh, i was particularly involved in this uh, activity to to recover the quality of the sodium in order to restart the reactor so here you can measure, this is, uh, so the, the, you can see that this uh, uh, is not so clean as I show you uh, previously as a plug-in temperature, but here you can notice that here you have a steady state, okay, uh, flow rate, and then suddenly you, you start to have this uh, plug-in, 
Okay, so the plugin was estimated to 218. Okay, what is the purification procedure? Uh, purification procedure is uh, when you know the plugin temperature, for example, you have an idea of the saturation temperature. We estimate maybe 20 degrees between the solubility and so solubility curve. And uh, so when you know this first value, generally, you, you fix the cold point temperature here, okay, which uh, generally 20 degrees below. So you purify. Of course, if your cold trap uh, works, and it's, it's of course the case, in the main circuit, your concentration uh, decreases. Okay? Here you can see decreases. And when you have, uh, let's say, uh, a diminution of 10 degrees about of saturation temperature, you reduce again the cold point temperature, and so on. So you reduce progressively in order to reduce the oxygen impurities content in the sodium. So it's a step-by-step -step, uh, procedure. And when you stop, you, uh, you stop when the cold point temperature is around uh, 110. Okay, not below because you want to avoid any hazards of freezing the sodium in this, uh, in this de design. Some design options now. Uh, sodium distribution is a cold trap. You have a, a distribution, it's a, what we call a ring type heater. Cooling fluid can be hair, oil, sodium, potassium, uh, and oil in static sodium, uh, potassium, and so on. Internal heat exchanger to avoid the plugging in the inlet pipe, as I explained you. The cooler, it can be a single cooler or modular coolers. Uh, we have developed concepts with the modular coolers in order to have some flexibility to make a variation of the delta T uh, in the cold trap as a function of the uh, situations. Uh, support for impurities, it can be a knitted mesh, means, uh, as I told you, some wires. Uh, this generally this wire, we have a supplier providing wires, the diameter of the wire is uh, 0.3 millimeter. So you can see it's a, small diameter, pole rings in Germany, for example, and we have developed also concepts with no mesh, but just only a cooled wall. Why? Because near the wall where you have the cooler, you have a delta T, and as I told you in the kinetics, it's a very uh, efficient to trap the hydride, sodium hydride. Yes? You remember? So we use this, uh, this information already. Uh, location of support, uh, on surface per volume, uh, okay, the location and the surface per volume depends on the design requirements, okay, there are uh, some requirements, I don't go, of course, in detail here. Uh, an example of uh, cold trap, which was uh, very innovative in the 70s, end of the 70s, it's uh, integrated cold trap. This concept has been also recently selected for BN 1200 reactor, in uh, Russia, and also for the next step, uh, for the FBR, FBR reactors that are designed in India after the PFBR. They intend to build the two uh, FBR in India, in, uh, in Kalpakam, and um, the same for uh, uh, here, and also I've heard that uh, uh, for VTR project, even if now it's uh, more or less frozen, this project, but. They, they, they are foreseen and integrated. You can see here the reactor, okay? Uh, here you have the primary circuit, the core here, the structures below the core, sodium circulates here, enters at about 400 degrees Celsius and leaves at 550. Uh, this is a super, uh, an example of super phoenix. Here you have a control plug where you have here the temperatures below, the, below this uh, control plug in front of each outlet of fuel assemblies to detect any variation of temperature in the, from the core and any plugging, in fact, because if you have a somewhere uh, a, a partial plugging, of course, you, have, uh, you lose your cooling uh, efficiency, and so you have a, an in increase of the temperature. It can be an initiator of severe accidents, of course. You can reach uh, maybe boiling, okay, in uh, one subassembly, and uh, in this case, uh, you can uh, create uh, a sequence of severe accident. But here, you have hot plenum here and the cold plenum below. Okay, 
Here, the sodium enters, uh, hot, uh, hot sodium enters in the intermediate heat exchanger, and then the sodium comes back in the lower part, and uh, is, uh, the sodium is sent thanks to a mechanical pump below the core through a, what we call a diagrid. A diagrid is a system which uh, allows you to fix all the hexagonal uh, fuel assemblies um, and constitute the, the core. Yeah? And uh, for the first time, we decided to have internal cold traps. What is the cold trap here? It is uh, located in the hot plenum. It means uh, at a temperature of 550. At the bottom here, you have an uh, electromagnetic pump, okay, uh, which uh, extracts the sodium, hot sodium, from the so hot plenum. Circulates here, you can see in orange, you have an internal heat exchanger. Then the sodium reaches a temperature of 180 around, and then is uh, sent inside here. You have here, you can see a pink uh, coil. It is uh, in which we circulate nitrogen. Of course, we are not going to have air in the primary circuit. Okay, so nitrogen. And uh, so we have a cooling, the cooler is here. And uh, when the sodium is extracted, a part can be directly released or another part can circulate in the heat, heat exchanger. Uh, why a part only? Is uh, if you have a different uh, flow rates in the heat exchanger, you have the capacity to modify the uh, temperature at the entrance of the uh, cooled area. And uh, what is interesting here, you can see here on the upper part, uh, above the slab, okay, you, can, you have here an operator, uh, you have a, a hole in which we can introduce what we call a cartridge. The cartridge is inside, and uh, so in this cartridge, you have uh, uh, the mesh, okay, to support the, the crystals. You have in the lower part, here you have what we call a bayonet uh, connection, and uh, uh, here in the upper part, we have a biological shielding and so on. So when we want to replace, when this cartridge is full of, full of impurities, you have the possibility to uh, here to install uh, a cask, okay, and extract the cartridge, replace, oh, sorry, and uh, extract the and extract the the lower part, store it before the treatment for example, cleaning with water in a cleaning pit, and install a, a new one, empty of impurities, of course. So it means that when you have to replace, you don't replace the wall system, you have just to replace the, the, this cartridge. Okay? We did that several times in Superphonics, and it was very efficient, even during the large pollution. Okay? So we are, it was a very uh, a good success, and, uh, and, uh, but this system, you can imagine that it's not so easy to design, because the diameter is 1.2 meters, about, uh, and you are inside uh, sodium at uh, 550, and uh, in the center you want to have um, uh, 110, okay? So it means that you need to have a, a very, very good insulation, okay? But it was, uh, it was okay. okay. Expensive, expensive. Yeah, the, the component is expensive, but the, the cartridge after that is not expensive, in fact, mm -hmm. huh? because you have no constraints. Even assuming that you have a leak, you are inside the primary circuit. So even if you have a small leak of sodium uh, due to, uh, uh, let's say, a crack in a weld, it's not really an issue, a big issue, in fact. Huh? But it's, uh, yes, it's expensive, but uh, for uh, several people, it was a big surprise to have no problems with this component. <laughs> Okay, here you have a, so you can see the, the shape. Here, this is the upper part, okay, with, you can see the hole in which we insert the cartridge. And in the lower part, we have uh, here, you can see an ele electromagnetic pump, uh, an electromagnetic pump which uh, circulates the, the sodium inside. Uh, the length is 12 meters, huh? okay, because you have three meters through the slab. Huh? A particularity of uh, this reactor, just to, to recall uh, something which is obvious for us, but not for everybody, in uh, sodium-fast reactors, you can walk, okay, 
you can uh, you can you can see here some uh, uh, guy and uh, personally uh, I was uh, several times because I was in charge of this component uh, operation of this component and you can uh, notice that you can work even in the reactor at 100% uh, of operation in this uh, in this area yeah so this is a peculiarity of uh, these reactors uh, liquid metal reactors okay but uh, sometimes we have external loop. Here you have the secondary loop of superphenix. In superphenix, we have uh, four loops, four loops, and uh, one of them, uh, four loops, uh, you have here two intermediate exchangers. We circulate the, the sodium, and send the sodium is sent to uh, the steam generator here. For each loop, we have four loops. Each, uh, each uh, steam generator unit is 750 thermal megawatt. Okay, so it's a huge monolithic, we call that monolithic steam generator, because there is another option to have uh, modular steam generators. It means uh, several modules, which are maybe more comfortable in case of uh, an issue. You can replace, you can st shut down one module, module and replace it, but without stopping the reactor. Okay. Fortunately, in Super Phoenix, we didn't face uh, a problem like that. This is the reason why the same option was uh, also used for uh, Astrid project. And here you can see the sodium at the outlet of the steam generator, two pipes coming back to the pump. The pump is installed on the cold leg of the system. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, one pipe. And then after the pump, you go to two pipes going to the two intermediate heat exchanger. For each loop, we have two intermediate heat exchanger and one steam generator. And here in uh, Violinin, you can see here the cold trap. So the cold trap is here, it's not immersed. You have a circulation of sodium, okay, sent to a cold trap. A cold trap is here, is what I have shown to you uh, previously. Here you can see uh, in a 3D, uh, 3D view, where you can see uh, yellow the heater, red the intermediate uh, uh, internal it exchanger, Okay, here the cooling area, in green the coil with the oil, and in the jacket you have a sodium potassium and so on. Okay, the same, huh? just different view. Uh, one issue with these cold traps is that you can notice that we have deposits here. But the problem with this concept is that, which was designed in the mid of 70s, is that you have uh, in, uh, deposits here, so uh, you have a variation of pressure drop inside, and so uh, very quickly you have a circ uh, not very quickly, but after some loading, you have a circulation of sodium in the upper part where the, there is the lowest pressure drop. Okay, and so you can have a circulation, and we have observed in Phoenix after four or five years, in fact, the sodium goes through here, but it's cooled by because the sodium is uh, conducting uh, thermal conducting. Uh, media and here you have at the bottom when you enter in the inner pipe conditions to have a plugging okay so it means that uh, at the end of the life of the uh, the cold trap uh, we observe some plugging and so the filling rate was not so good and second point is that uh, the the efficiency of the cold trap it's impossible in such a system to reach an efficiency of one okay you remember the the description it's not possible to uh, reach a minimum value because a part of the sodium goes through the mesh in an area where it is not super saturated. Okay, so we have a profile. You have an uh, evolution of the profile of temperature, evolution of the profile of the circulation. So you can understand that this, uh, the modeling of this, uh, the modeling of this uh, uh, cold trap is not so easy because uh, an, exchange, an heat exchanger, okay, there are no change in the, uh, in the um, in the flow, okay, and many uh, for a pump the same. But for this component, because it's very specific, you have not only heat transfer, but you have also mass transfer. Okay. Okay. So, yes, it's just a demonstration of the efficiency. A part of the flow rate is going in the upper part, and so the uh, overall efficiency here cannot be one by, as I told you. But now remember of the kinetics, okay? What we have seen is that for oxide, uh, hydride, 
we can, uh, temperature is important because of the nucleation, the first point. And for the oxide, the nucleation is, uh, uh, has a lower kinetic, okay, because of the limiting step of diffusion. So it means that it's generally good to have a, here you can reach in this trap, you reach the cold point temperature here, but we have an additional area at the cold point temperature where we have uh, good conditions to give more time for the oxide to nucleate. So it means that in this concept, we have uh, two zones, uh, one for the hydride, okay, without, without uh, mesh, except on the wall, we have some systems in order to that uh, cake, the cake of uh, uh, sodium hydride, in order to avoid suddenly to uh, uh, drop <laughs> okay, the cake in the lower part, we have uh, some elements to fix, to fix the, okay? So the, we call this uh, concept uh, psychos, uh, piège, P for piège, trap, in fact, in French. Um, uh, the separating impurities by crystallization of hydride and oxide of sodium. Okay, it was the title of a movie, horror movie, uh, during this period. Uh, wow. Designed for Super Phoenix. Main advantage: efficiency of one for no sodium hydride and for sodium oxide. Flow rate uh, minimized to limit the heat loss in the circuit. Yes, uh, because uh, when you have traps, you cool down, you lose some heat, okay? It's, it's not uh, large, but nevertheless, it's a, it can be a parameter. Large capacity, it uh, story was patented and uh, then optimized, uh, sized by uh, Stein Industry, which was uh, in fact Alstom now, sized for Super Phoenix and uh, test in experimental loop and uh, installed on the, on the Super Phoenix during the two last years of the reactor. And the uh, size also more recently for large facility we anticipate to support uh, Astrid Keops project in Kadarash. Okay, I don't go in detail. Uh, it's an uh, explanation. Uh, for EFR, EFR project, European Fast Reactor. Uh, Super Phoenix was uh, Italian, French, and, um, and Debene, Deutsch. Uh, Belgium Netherlands uh, Association. After that, uh, our colleagues from UK came in the EFR project. Okay, so there were, I would say, mostly four partners, including uh, UK. And we have developed a new concept uh, in order to uh, improve again the loading capacity and uh, to keep uh, efficiency of one for sodium hydride and sodium oxide. Here you can see this is not a real uh, design, but it is a design of the mock-up. You can see there are some plates uh, with some kind of, I would say, uh, um, wires, uh, uh, metallic wires to support the nucleation, to promote. At the beginning, it's uh, the circulation, uh, you go through the plates, okay? And when the, you have deposits, uh, slowly you have, uh, okay, circulation around the plates, okay, like that. It looks like some chemical engineering uh, systems, uh, like, for example, distillation or so on, uh, called the pyramid. Here you have the evolution of the secondary coal traps in France. So Phoenix, here, Super Phoenix. In Phoenix, we have not this exchanger in the upper part, okay? But uh, it was not a good concept, and uh, the the cooling is inside, inside the sodium also, the, the coil. It's not good because if you have a, an ingress of oil, you produce hydrogen, and uh, for the operator, it can be a sodium water reaction. So it's not really... Uh, so for Super Phoenix, they decided to have an external uh, jacket with a coil. Super Phoenix, uh, second version, because, and for EFR, uh, uh, for EFR, uh, gas, Gas cooled uh, pyramid. You can notice that uh, Psychos and Pyramid have the same height and the same diameter. In fact, in the idea of EDF, it was intended that after this uh, first version, we will uh, use EFR for the secondary loops, air cooled, uh, air cooled, 
in order to avoid uh, circulation of oil everywhere and so on to, to simplify the operation. Unfortunately, as you know, due to political decision in 1997, there was a decision to, to shut down Super Phoenix. Uh, okay, so it's uh, my big uh, <laughs> regret, but history is story. Okay, uh, other coal traps, uh, just I show you uh, in Russia uh, and India. Uh, sometimes we have not the same basis, experimental basis to design the coal traps. So here, you, oops, sorry, you can see that uh, you can see that uh, we have different uh, geometries. Here you can see uh, BR5, uh, uh, BN350 in Kazakhstan, BN600, and so on. So I don't want to, to go in detail, but uh, it was foreseen uh, last year to have a benchmark on the design of a coal trap. So we, uh, it, was, uh, it is a task, we hope, one day to to, to perform it, uh, but it means that we have different geometries, okay? And uh, if you look uh, in uh, literature, you will find a lot of designs, okay? But uh, I think that uh, it's quite interesting, the design of this apparatus. <laughs> Here, you have a coal trap in India. In fact, if you look, it's a mix of a pyramid, okay, in the upper part, okay, and in the lower part of Psychos. And effectively, if you look at the, the paper, uh, they, in a, if you look the paper uh, produced by uh, EJK uh, colleagues, in fact, they have decided to have a, a mix of the two concepts with reference to pyramid and, and psychos. Okay, a qualification strategy. This is an important topic. Uh, qualification. Uh, what we did in the past, I think it's very important for you, is uh, we have, uh, in the 80s, we have a definition of the main requirements. Design of the one-scale coal trap for the reactor. We have identification of similitude rules. It can be the heat transfer, the residence time in each zone, mesh density, and so you, and then you have a downscaling of the, of the, of the mock-up, manufacturing of the mock-up, loading, of the ancillary system. You need uh, to have an ancillary coal trap, for example, to distribute the sodium with the given pollution at the entrance of the mock-up. And then you operate in various conditions and you check the performance of your coal trap. You can imagine that uh, it takes a lot of time, the qualification of the coal trap. So today, we have decided to have uh, another tool, okay? Uh, we have a, a large progress in CFD. Uh, we have also uh, a lot of feedback. We have the kinetics also, and we have introduced that in a new code called ANAIS. And uh, ANAIS means Advanced Model for Sodium, uh, sodium Integrated Purification Systems. It's also the name of my daughter. Right? It's not, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, we use this, uh, this model. So we have developed this model, and uh, what is in, uh, it's not so easy to, to model that. Okay, why? Because in such a system, you have uh, flows, you have a thermal exchange, you have to model also mass transfer, and you have also to uh, take into account the deposits in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, geometry variation, in fact. The mesh, the mesh of the calculations is not the same uh, at the beginning and uh, in the half of the life of the, uh, of the coal trap and at the end, okay? So, there is a permanent uh, adaptation of the mesh for the calculation of the, of the flow. So it's uh, quite, um, quite complex, but we did. Uh, we take into account uh, two types of crystallization in the mesh, in the mesh, metallic mesh, okay, this time, and also on the cold walls. I don't go in details, you will see, but after that, we have made a simulation of uh, experimental data we got in the past, okay, we have all the results for the qualification of this component. And uh, we also model also in the upper part, which was not the easiest part. You have deposits for the hydride on the cold wall. Here you can see uh, a view on the deposits. Huh? You can see hydride deposits 
uh, on, the, on the wall. What is important to notice is that it's a porous media, this crystal, so you don't have a, a significant variation of the performance of the heat exchanger because uh, the sodium is, a, uh, you have a very high con thermal conduction, and so you can have deposits up to 8 to 10 centimeters without, without a significant variation of the, of the cooling, of the performance. And so we have a very detailed model of this area, for example, here. We have uh, deposits. We have uh, what we call diffuse interface. When you have an ion of hydrogen, it diffuses through here. And of course, you promote the nucleation, uh, the, the growth first, and also the nucleation on the external surface, on crystals, on crystals. So the, some crystals are, are the basis for nucleation. OK? We have a propagation of the front of deposits. So it's a. Uh, um, Okay, it, it works. <laughs> and uh, we describe the evolution of the deposits with time, okay? And uh, we are able also to have both simulation of the hydrogen and the oxygen in the lower part. So uh, now uh, the purification, here you have the purification system design methodology. What is important? Identification of the impurities to be removed. Assessment of the source as the production rates continues or, the, or discontinuous. Assessment of the potential sinks. It means that in a reactor you have a cold trap, but you have also corrosion. Okay? So oxygen can be trapped also by corrosion. So you, you, you need to take into account this phenomena. And com uh, induction and a specific uh, specification on the removal rate. Okay? Evaluation of the amount of impurities to be removed from the circuit. Okay? The amount. You have to decide. Uh, how long you want to operate the cold trap before to replace all the, all the cold trap or only the cartridge in case of integrated uh, purification system. Simulation with uh, analysis code uh, in order to estimate if there are not so places where you can have uh, uh, deposits and plugging uh, too early uh, plugging in some parts because you have a bad design somewhere. Okay, so, okay, same criteria, I go. How to control the feeling rate? Mass balance. Monitoring of the pressure drop of the pump. If you increase the, 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 the plugging, you need to increase the intensity of, at the electromagnetic pump, okay, in order to increase the, to compensate the increase of the pressure drop. Visual control by endoscopy. Sometimes we did that, you know, they're just for, experimental and uh, research purpose to see directly on the secondary trap what was really the, the, the depo where are really the deposits. Uh, I we did that. And the last one uh, is uh, neutron transmission measurement. We have developed a very specific neutronic technique to control the deposits inside. In fact, uh, here, just I show you, here you, are, you can see the cold trap. In the center, there is a symbol in which we have a possibility to send uh, a fast neutron source. We use generally Californium 252. And when you have uh, here, the, it's uh, transported by pneumatic means. And in front of, we have a counter, helium-free counter. You count the neutrons. Of course, at the beginning, when the trap is new, uh, the neutrons are not thermalized by hydrogen. But when you increase the loading with hydrogen, we have an impact on the neutron distribution, yeah? Uh, the neutron uh, number, the flux of neutron. Okay. Uh, yes, just uh, you will see the, the synthesis end. Here you can see the storage cask and the neutron counter here. So it means that you can control by moving the, the source and the, and the counter to measure uh, a profile of impurities, okay? So we did that on Phoenix and Super Phoenix uh, also. Uh, here, you can see the profile of impurities. So initial is, uh, of course, you have, a, this is the reference, but uh, six months after, you, you, you measure and you have a profile and so on. So you can, here on this concept, which was not a reference concept, it was a prototype, with, uh, I would say, I don't explain why, but it was a bad design. Uh, here we are noticed that at the bottom, 
here the, the cooler was inside, and so it was a good place to have deposits of hydride. When, but when, they, when we uh, used this trap designed by another team, uh, we have noticed that we are pretty sure that we will have some uh, problems in the lower part with the uh, deposition of hydride, because as I told you, hydride is able to deposit not in a mesh, but on a cold wall. And effectively, you can see that at this level, we can notice a large increase of the deposits, and it was the reason why very quickly we decided to remove this trap and to set up new traps, okay? Hot trapping, hot trapping, <coughs> uh, two minutes. Hot trapping is uh, when you have a very small volume of sodium to purify. We developed that for an uh, internal uh, loop we never installed in a fe Phoenix. It was intended to have a specific sodium loop inside the core in order to test uh, some uh, materials, yeah? And so for that, uh, a cold trap uh, with, yes, uh, sorry, this uh, experiment with a very uh, important control of oxygen because if you have samples and see if suddenly you have an increase due to the loss of uh, cooling, uh, it's, uh, it's not a good uh, situation with regards to the, the specimens, material, uh, material specimen. So we decided to have a hot trap because you don't need to cool the sodium. And we have, uh, uh, we have selected this composition. We made a screening of uh, different composition, zirconium titanium alloy, to trap the oxygen. Okay, here we have obtained the kinetics. We have a publication on that. And, oops, sorry. And uh, uh, we have the capacity. So it's for small, uh, small amount of sodium, okay, in very specific cases. Uh, for trapping activated corrosion <coughs> products, there was some developments in the past, initially in Germany and uh, EBR2, and uh, with the nickel foils, you can trap these activated corrosion products. The uh, idea of uh, EBR2, uh, uh, in the US of EBR2 is to equip some fuel assemblies with these uh, nickel foils in order to trap, to trap these uh, impurities, uh, uh, activated corrosion products. And as you know, we remove the fuel assemblies uh, periodically, so in fact, it's not really an issue to, to extract this pollution. Uh, to trap the uh, cesium, cesium, you can trap with uh, carbon traps. It was used, uh, again, in uh, EBR2, but uh, also in uh, Rhapsody, in Rhapsody to purify the sodium. In some other facilities also, maybe uh, it was well-known process. And it's a solid foam, solid foam of carbon. You trap by adsorption, absorption, sorry, the cesium, and it's very efficient also to decontaminate. We are going to do this operation for Phoenix. Phoenix, we are going to start uh, decontamination of sodium prior to treatment of the sodium with a NOAA process. Uh, instrumentation, I spoke about the plug-in meter, oxygen meter, oxygen meter, there was a lot of developments in the 70s, 80s on oxygen meters. Here, here you can see uh, one uh, which was really well designed and very efficient. It was our well oxygen meter. Uh, what is an electrochemical uh, oxygen meter? You measure a difference of potential between a reference, between a reference. In this case, it can be inside we have uh, indium, indium oxide in the lower part. You have an electrical wire made, uh, for example, of molybdenum. When the sodium enters, there is a difference of potential because the concentration in the sodium is, uh, very, uh, there is uh, some variations. So you have a variation of the signal. Here you have, a, so it's fixed uh, in the pipe. In the upper part, you have uh, some uh, copper exchanger in order to freeze the sodium. So you have uh, uh, to ensure the tightness of the system. You, you, have a, you freeze a, a part of sodium in order to uh, avoid uh, extraction. So it works very well. So you have here electrolyte, okay? Here you have a calibration curve. Uh, it means that it's very accurate and uh, it's possible to, you need to calibrate this uh, apparatus before to install on the facility. But you have a very good stability. In fact, it was uh, very, very efficient. Uh, hydrogen meter, uh, the principle is uh, you have a membrane, nickel membrane. On the other side, you have vacuum, you pump, 
and hydrogen permeates from the sodium to the vacuum system. And on the other side, you have a mass spectrometer to measure the hydrogen. This is one system. There is another system, is electrochemical hydrogen meter. There was some developments in the 80s, and uh, it was uh, developed also by India, and I think also by uh, Russia, uh, also this device. It's uh, maybe simpler. Uh, in order to compare with uh, our system, we uh, installed it in the Phoenix reactor uh, 12 years ago, and compare the signals of uh, conventional hydrogen meter by permission and electrochemical. And you can notice here, this is uh, uh, on the lower part, the electrochemical hydrogen meter. You can see that is, uh, you detect the, in, uh, uh, the variation of hydrogen, uh, same time, no delay, uh, very good comparison uh, on the two. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. So we have one minute for the questions. I will ask one uh, about SMR cold trap for the SMRs because as you develop in now uh, mm -hmm. SMR sodium cool mm -hmm. SMR, I see the devices are like big, like eight meters tall, two meters diameter. Uh, for the cold trap, you mean? Yeah, but yes. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to do it for the this, you know purification for the sodium cooled SMRs. What, what is the solution? Do you also need this? Uh, you mean, uh, for example, internal integrated, integrated system? Mm -hmm. No, just uh, what are ideas? How, how can you do it, cold traps for the small? Uh, small? Uh, for small modular reactors? Yeah. But I think that, uh, I think it will be an optimization, but I think that the internal, uh, integrated option is a good option. Uh, I think we are able to, uh, see, uh, one point is the diameter of the system, so generally. Yeah? So uh, if we integrate a cold trap, we need to reduce the, the diameter. So we think it is possible because uh, we, I did that for a project called SPX2 a long time ago. So it's, I think in principle is possible. And uh, effectively, the idea is to avoid one of the big advantage. Yeah, I didn't mention that, but if you have integrated the uh, cold trap, you have no circulation of active sodium out of the main uh, vessel. So it's a big advantage in terms of safety assessment. And so I think that uh, it seems to me that integrated uh, system would be uh, more convenient for these uh, small modular reactors because if you start to have ancillary systems, we see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Uh, my uh, question about the maintenance time of the cold trap. Uh -huh. uh, if uh, I understand correctly, you say that because of the high uh, pollution, uh, uh, the reactor shut down and uh, the maintenance. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the main maintenance time uh, for? Ah, uh, so for a, uh, for a cartridge ch changing. Ah, okay, I understand. Uh, so, uh, well, if you have a cartridge, for example, in Super Phoenix, it was uh, let's say a maximum one week to replace the two cartridges. It can be done during the handling uh, fuel fuel assemblies uh, fuel assemblies uh, handling okay in a parallel okay so but you need to know what is the ratio of the, of the filling of the your cold trap so you need to follow the evolution of the cold trap okay in order to anticipate you can say for example next stop shutdown normal shutdown of the reactor for mm. to uh, for the fuel assemblies the management. You, you, you can foresee also, in parallel way, uh, one week dedicated to the uh, removal of the cartridge. If it is another system, you can, if it is an external loop, you can, you can have, of course, uh, extract, uh, cut the cold traps, and you have a spare, spare cold trap. And what to do on the main cold trap? We have uh, two options, or you are very rich and uh, okay, you, you can, 
wait for the decommissioning, okay, clearly. And uh, uh, our second option is also to uh, what we call regeneration. Uh, there is some process to regenerate. We have developed one for EFR called the PRIAM. Uh, we have a regeneration process where we dissolve again the impurities and we separate oxygen and hydrogen, tritiated hydrogen because we have tritium, and we manage the tritium, uh, hydrogen tritiated, uh, uh, for example, by oxidation. And uh, after that, we reinstall the, the external cold trap. Yeah. It generally, we don't have uh, seals and join. Generally, we prefer to have uh, welding. Uh, welding in order to avoid any risk of uh, leak, okay? Uh, I know, uh, uh, if uh, <laughs> I know it uh, correctly, uh, in a regular uh, refueling time, the, this uh, system also maintenance in a, in a regular refueling times. Uh, yes, yes. yes. For, but uh, in this time, is it a, a particular time that it is for occurred? Super Phoenix, for Super Phoenix, uh, for the cartridge, it was uh, every two years. Every two oh, years. Okay, okay. okay? Uh, and yeah. for uh, external cold traps, for the uh, first uh, generation, which was re uh, changed, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it was every maybe four, four, five years, okay? And the new generation of cold traps, it was anticipated, and particularly the last one, every 12 or 15 years. Okay? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, a more question, uh, uh, the primary and secondary uh, uh, sodium uh, purification uh, uh, has a separate uh, cold trap or one cold trap for uh, two uh, loops? Uh, for primary and secondary? Ah, uh, it's different. different. Different separate? Uh, yeah, because, uh, because uh, for one reason, the, the primary you can have activated corrosion products. Uh, okay. On the secondary, uh, the only contaminant is tritium. So tritium, of course, we have to deal with, but uh, it's a very small amount, and uh, it's not. Uh, it's a more. The primary is loaded mainly with uh, oxide, mm -hmm. okay. okay, and the secondary with hydride. Hydride, in a steady oh, okay. state operation. Okay, thank you, thank you for. Mm. Any? Yeah, please. Thank you, Dr. Lachey. Uh, is it more on the basic side? Uh, why is tritium produced on the on the secondary? Is it because of ah, absorption of neutron? Uh, no, it's not in the secondary, in the primary. But uh, during my next presentation, I will explain this point. Okay, again, thank you very much. So we are nearly in time, only five minutes late. And let's have a coffee break and start at 10, 10.50, exactly. And I will put this paper.